In western North Carolina, we are seeing catastrophic flooding. That includes Asheville, North Carolina. Just over the mountains, much of Asheville, North Carolina is underwater this afternoon. I-40 shut down in both directions between Tennessee and North Carolina. The French Broad River is reaching record levels near the Biltmore Estate. The Buncombe County Sheriff says its office received more than a thousand missing persons reports. Thousands of people are still without power and water. Areas of the city are completely underwater, trapping people without basic supplies. We are here in Biltmore Village where you can hear the emergency helicopters overhead bringing necessary aid to the people of Asheville. In Biltmore Village, the scene is pretty dim. We thought we were hurting in our neighborhood. And then on the first day, we took a drive out to see what we could find, water, food. We realized how lucky we were. There's telegraph poles that have been snapped like toothpicks trees down at the end of the roads, impossible to pass. I've not seen anything like it. I knew it was bad, but you always hope that it's not going to be that bad. And this is just a fraction of what has happened to Western North Carolina. You know, raising two, two kids here in the mountains with my wife. <laughs> we've, we've gone to most of these restaurants together as a family. This community is so important to us. and. Um, What it's going to take to get Asheville back to what it was is, I mean, it's going to be a long time. Everything's gone. Our awning was above water. That's, what, 26 feet worth of water. This was at a different level that we never could prepare for. David Ross is the landlord and contractor for Casablanca Cigar Bar and other buildings in the area. The level of devastation that I've received as a landlord is beyond my, I think, understanding at the moment. I'm doing what I can because it's my community and my people. Now that the water has receded, Ross is picking up the pieces with help from the community. We have friends and, and customers and people who met through this business just show up and help. In some of their darkest moments, they are trying to find the light. I think there's a lot of people that are still not even comprehending what they're about to come into that own shops and businesses and oh, people. This is the register! <laughs> Oh my God. It's like we found a treasure. Despite the devastation, they are focused on the future. We just gotta cry a little bit and move on. I'm hoping for the best in people. I'm hoping for, right, the ability to rebuild and regroup. And, and again, I'm, I'm gonna do my best to help my community because that's what we do in these circumstances, right? Our crews started in Biltmore Village and fanned out across surrounding communities, which led us to Swananoa, a guitar that will never strum again, a calendar stuck in time, a blanket forever without warmth, all sights here in Swananoa. It's almost like you're watching a movie. But for Emily Russell, it's her new reality. After Hurricane Helene tore apart the home she's lived in her entire life while she was inside. When I seen the water coming up and it kicked in my front door and then our back door at the same time, and within 30 seconds it went from starting to come to up to my neck. She says she was stuck inside for more than 12 hours, sitting in a mixture of water and gasoline. Do I jump out the window and try to float on something so that I'm not about to die and drown and smell gas? Or do I just sit in the bedroom and wait for help? The house um, is basically just going to be bulldozed. Um, we've lost everything in it. Um, so we're just staying with family and praying. I got a truck wrapped around the tree there, and my tractor, and a Corvette underneath the trailer over there, and a Mustang over there in the field. Danny Bailey has lived next door since 1968. He was able to evacuate. Now, he's lost everything. 
it's really hard to see other people that are way worse off than we are. Fred Forrester has lived just down the road for 24 years. He spent days digging the river silt out of his home. We have already emptied two rooms. We've got three bedrooms yet to um, empty out and rip carpet out of. It's hard work, made harder without running water, power, even cell service. How do you clean your hands? There's no showers. Forrester says he's just glad he has a home still standing. That all cuts pretty deep. A community torn apart in just one day. The River Arts District was unrecognizable. Once a thriving, cool place to socialize, visit art galleries, and gather with friends. Went from this to this in a matter of days. I remember when we were building the River Arts District and what did Asheville has come to in the last 10 years, watching us build everything and now just to see it like back to, to ground zero, it's devastating. Water so high, it far surpassed the 1916 flood. This black line is where the waters were just days ago, a foot above the 1916 flood line. I didn't realize how bad it was because I had no service, but watching it now, it's I can't, I can't describe it. One man, Hartwell Carson, an environmental activist, has a vested interest in the health of the French Broad River. When he kayaked through the floodwaters, he couldn't believe his eyes. There's an oil distribution place there and the oil tanks were flipped over. We paddled up through a gas station and gas was just coming out of the, the ground. You know, propane tanks floating by, trash just trash and debris just coming out of buildings. The same images everywhere you look. And these are people's like hopes and dreams. You know, these are they put their livelihoods and their time and energy into building these businesses. When I grew up, people talked about the blizzard of '93, and this is exactly our generation's going to be talking about this forever. On our way to Chimney Rock and Lake Lure, we stopped off in the Fairview community. When we came across deteriorating roads and neighbors hard at work. Neighbors in this Cane Creek community are busy shoring up this embankment, not only to prevent deterioration of their road into their neighborhood, but also that pipe you see there is their main source of water. They're trying to get water back as soon as possible, and they think this will help. The electric conduit for our community crosses the creek under this bridge, and we're trying to get that clear enough that Duke can see there's no damage to their lines. If they can see that, they said they can turn us on in there. We're, we're concerned it's going to be weeks, many weeks, until they're actually able to get water, to you know, potable water in, in the pipes up to us. This neighborhood community doing all the work to help themselves. They've been disconnected from the outside world with no signal. We don't really even know a whole lot of what's going on. We hear stories and then find out they were wrong because we don't have internet. So we, we kind of know that Chimney Rock and uh, the town of Lake Lure are gone. Uh, other, some other places have been wiped away. And it's through pure determination and grit that they are able to keep going, keep helping. One thing that we do know Right up on the bank here, there's several homes that were accessed from around the other side. They're not part of our community, but their bridge is gone, and they've been rappelling down the bank over here. We live on the hill up here. I don't know how I can see it. I got some rope from the neighbors and put a little rappelling system to go up about, say, 22 feet of stretch here. Right up this hill, the only entrance to Philip Buda Morgan's home. You want to watch your step if you take a tumble, you can come down on the concrete and the rocks, but... Basically, this is how I've been able to get a lot of supplies up this way. He took me on the very steep path to his home that he had to carve himself. Please watch your step. He knew when he saw Cane Creek rising, it was going to be bad. I was seeing like hay bales, coolers, parts of vehicles, just full on trees coming down the river. And uh, it, it, was, it was absolutely terrifying for sure. And so badly damaged, he and his family were trapped, including his brother, who is bedridden and on oxygen after a life-altering stroke. The Fairview Fire Department, those are tenacious, tough, bad dudes. 
and they actually climbed up the most vertical part of the embankment to bring us uh, water and supplies, check on my brother, bring us gasoline for the generator they lent us. Oh, this is your house. Morgan didn't realize how much it's taking a toll until he saw one of his best friends at the local oh, store. And even right now, I'm choked up talking about it, trying to be macho and uh, hold back. It was just overwhelming to know that like someone that dear to me is still good. But he is still unsure if all of his loved ones are safe. Okay. Still just in the back of my mind amongst doing all the stuff I have to do. I'm just waiting to hear something about losing someone and that. And uh, That's been a hard one. That's been, that's one that just kind of creeps up on you at night when you try to get to sleep. We went deeper into Fairview, still on our journey to Chimney Rock, and had to pull over. The roads washed away, literally crumbling. We could not go any further and were advised not to by local aid workers. All right, good. Well, you got the right boots. We met Mitch Colby, who offered to take me on an ATV ride to see the parts of Fairview that are unreachable. <laughs> Mitch is an artist who lives on this 100-acre sheep farm. The storm seems to have come right up through the Continental Divide. A little tiny stream. I quickly learned why driving these roads is impossible. Holes, crumbling asphalt, not to mention downed trees and debris everywhere you look. It changed this landscape forever. The further we drove, the more damage we encountered. Well, it's, it's total chaos. I mean, you have mountain slides that have pushed houses into roads and then giant boulders have been pushed off the mountains into the road, into houses. Houses have been pushed um, 200 yards away from their foundations and <laughs> it'll never be the same. These are their darkest days. I had a helicopter over here. They airlifted a body that'd been there for four days. Nobody knew about it, a dog found it. And it might be a relative of some of these people right here, we don't know. It's unfathomable what these people have witnessed, and that was evident at Nesbitt Chapel Church. Made it to the church that is providing a spot for food and water and help for these people. Um, this is in the Fairview community, and hopefully they're getting exactly what they need. Comfort food makes all the difference. What this is, is people's food defrosted. What kind? Do you have a special recipe? Uh, Mama gave it to me and I ain't gonna share it. <laughs> <laughs> David Trainer cooks every day at Nesbitt's Chapel Church. He lost everything. That happened, I couldn't get out of the house. All the doors and windows were cracked or jammed and it, it just twisted my house like it was a beer can. His focus now, acts of service. These people, David especially, literally saved my life because I don't know what I would have done because I didn't even know about this chapel. And they have everything you need. Help me and save me. And I am, I am um, humbled by these people. This church organized an effort to help on this whiteboard. Clothing, food, necessities, all available for the taking. And these people need it. I have seen things that will haunt me for the rest of my life. Wally Graber came down from Highlands and couldn't get back. So he's here now. There's such a need down here, so a couple of us are staying. You know, it's, it's tough. He doesn't know when he will be able to return home. And that's okay. These people need each other right now. It's, it's tough to watch people lose their whole family, it's, but it's also beautiful to watch people come together. Thank God, uh, you know, we got each other. And that'll get us through, you know. We're survivors up here. During our time in Asheville, we learned it wasn't just people deeply impacted by Helene. Flooding in Jennifer Ingalls' field. There's devastation everywhere. And her hay, which she needs for horses. I feel like no matter how hard I prepared or how hard I tried, um, I, 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 was, I failed. I failed my animals. To help others who feel the same way, she's working with Western North Carolina Livestock Center. It just gives me a chance to pay back and it takes some of the stress off of me of worrying about my place when I can help others in the process. Nolan Ingle knows firsthand how devastating flooding can be. In 2021, his two horses, Buck and Penny, were swept away. I had two of them to go underneath the trussle in the flood and I couldn't get there in time. The animals were okay, but this time, Nolan put them in Joe Gibson's barn. If you're in a community and 
you you got to help one another. The organization connects livestock owners with foster farms like Gibson's. It's also collecting donations and giving them out to farmers. It's a huge, huge weight has been lifted off our shoulders by by folks giving selflessly, you know, of their hay and feed. It's just, it's, it's something to see. When I look around and I see the damage that's been done, that fencing can be replaced, but lives can't. Someone just dropped it off, let's drop it right here. Evidence of humanity around every corner of this town. Acá de este lado. Volunteers at beloved Asheville have been speeding to distribute these supplies because when lives are on the line, there's not a second to waste. Ponco Bermejo is a co-director of the organization. He estimates that in one day, 100 volunteers reached 10,000 people in need. Keep us moving is all the love that we see, not the destruction that we saw in the river. Bermejo himself lives in Swannanoa. He recalls what it was like the day after the waters rose. You can hear people screaming, help, help. And when I happened to look in the river, I saw people hanging out in trees, hugging the trees, a family of three. Bermejo says beloved Asheville is ready for this. They've been training for 15 years, poised to hit the ground running the moment disaster strikes. I always say to everybody that no be waiting for the destruction to happen, for you to be organizing. Now it's a matter of endurance running, a marathon to heal a community. From necessary aid to comforting sounds ringing through the mountains. Brandy? Yes. <laughs> this is the moment Mark Starling heard his wife's voice for the first time after two days of silence. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. When Hurricane Helene hit Western North Carolina, Starling was at work at the WWNC radio station. This is the scene out in front of our house. His wife and son got stuck in their hometown of Black Mountain as more than four feet of water flooded their neighborhood. They waited in a car for seven and a half hours, hoping to survive. It was about 48 hours. Um, before I had heard from her. Then, while Mark was taking calls live on the radio, Brandy's call finally came through. And then my producer put her name up on the screen, and she's the only one I know that spells her name with two E's. And uh, I looked at the screen, and I just was confused. And I said, is this, is this who I think it is? And he just nodded his head. And um, <laughs> as you could tell, it was pretty much waterworks from there on. This has been the reality for many in the wake of Hurricane Helene. With cell towers out, people are unable to reach their loved ones or access important disaster relief information. We have been going wall to wall with our storm coverage since it hit. Starling's radio station has stayed on the air since the moment the disaster began. This is our continuing coverage right here on iHeartRadio Asheville. They've relied on ham radio satellite towers and a Starlink to stay on the air and access information. Radio employees spend the day fielding calls, finding the people who need help, and connecting them to the helpers. I get all of the information and then we just shout them out the best we can. We're trying to get people reunited with other people and, and we're just trying to use the power of radio to do that. Starling plans to continue on sleeping in a conference room, fielding endless phone calls, and helping countless people. Because in times of crisis, connection is crucial to survive. I love you. I love you too. Take care, babe. <laughs> Bye. Bye. A love of others, a love of community. Even people who were not in Asheville during the storm did everything possible to help their hometown. Asheville resident Jacqueline Shea was out of town when the storm hit, but that worked to her advantage because she had Wi-Fi. So she started compiling a list of resources and posting it on social media. And it pretty much just blew up overnight. So she made a document where others could add resources. It's grown now into a 40-page doc available in four languages, available offline. Now it's also a website called AshevilleRelief.com. It's still, still traumatic, but you feel helpless. And so starting this was actually a way that I kind of channeled some of that energy and help me actually feel like I was making a difference. I feel in awe of community. It's like, how do we all help each other? Um, and that's not, that's not gonna stop in a month, in a few weeks, in a few months. We then went back to Fairview to see the world of progress this neighborhood made in just one day. 24 hours ago, most of this debris was in the Cane Creek. 
but neighbors in this area have banded together to pull this stuff out of the creek so they can preserve the entrance into their neighborhood. On Wednesday morning, this area of Cane Creek underneath this bridge was filled with debris. And today, it is clear. Neighbors were also working really hard to shore up this embankment, not only to protect the only water line that takes water into their neighborhood, but also to protect this embankment. And they made so much progress in such little time. And it was time for our first hot meal of the week that brought us to one place we all know well. In severe weather situations, oftentimes a beacon of light is the Waffle House. If the Waffle House is open, things are going to be okay. It's a symbol of normalcy, and it's something that people in the Asheville area don't have much of right now. But this restaurant behind me has been open for most of the time. They closed for less than 24 hours when the rains came through, and they have been serving up hot meals on an emergency menu the entire time. It's to go only, but they've been providing hot meals for people, which is something people in Asheville don't have much of right now, as most restaurants are not yet open for business providing comfort for people. And we talked to one of the founding family members, Joe Rogers. He owns all of the Waffle Houses in part. He is inside this restaurant right now and told us it's so important to stay open in these situations. And he was glad that most of them in the greater Asheville area did not close during the storm. And local families without food at home are grateful. We're surviving and we're lucky to eat something. Because if there was no food and water, and water, we would have been like dead right now. Food, water, and beyond. One church went the extra mile to reach a downtown community desperately in need. Case after case of bottled water, diapers, even a hot meal. Want any ketchup or mustard? It's truly an answered prayer for this community. This is the church, you know, coming together and going, Wherever the need is, let's, let's do it. Thank you so much. Jason Garris, a pastor at the Highland Christian Church, is blown away by the support. There's no telling with the number of people that are going to get watered. And we just, we needed it. We needed a lot more water than just drinking water, like for flushing and all this stuff as well. Churches offered help and charities too, from all over. You can see the semi-trucks that just showed up in a really small neighborhood to make it happen. And the people behind the hot meal? A group from Ohio. They pack their trailer with as much food and grills as they could fit, and they just are, you know, grilling out. All for this community, who right now is struggling. I think it's wonderful. By him sending all this stuff to us, it's a blessing. Thank you. Bless, bless, bless. The amazing people that make up this community, the, the moms who are working just to try and make things happen, it's, it's more than you can bring in, you know. It's, I mean, so. I love the community. Everybody sticks together. Like you can see now how everybody's coming together and doing what they have to do. It's, it's just a great place to be. You know, people work together, help each other, and that, that means a lot. In just 96 hours, our teams witnessed damage, destruction, devastation, but also hope and resilience. We got As neighborhoods and businesses alike begin to clear the rubble, you see determination, optimism and unity. It's been a experience of community, like really showing up for one another, like everyone's on the threads, what do you need? You know, a couple days later, things are getting a little bit easier. Um, people are, you know, helping out the community and it's, it's really great. We're doing good, neighbors checking on neighbors, you know, hey, I've got a hot tip on this, they're doing water here, come down to the church, see that it's, it's amazing to see everyone. People helping people get through the aftermath of one of the most prolific weather events in the history of Western North Carolina.